um, yeah, I just wanted to um, uh, just ask ask of, uh, I'm gonna ask you all like, um, you have any questions or anything that you might want to add um, to what was shared? Um, anything that um, uh, you felt was uh, highlighted? Uh, by God to your heart, you know, as we read through all these things, what is your, uh, I mean, what is it that you understood? What is it that you, um, yeah, what is it that, yeah, go ahead, Charles. Uh, Thank you, Pastor. Um, this yeah. thing of, of evangelism and being an evangelist is really powerful uh, because. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at at Philip, the one that we have been handling in the pre previous hour, and the way God is using him, uh, he is not uh, doing the the formal things of evangelism, but he is doing evangelism in a, a spectacular way. So I'm seeing about a call for evangelism, though there are offices, but really deep to be an evangelist it's so so deep to be an evangelist and one needs to be to have lived a life of surrender you mm. totally surrender and then you are used otherwise you find yourself in a desert another time you are in the city another time you are here so i am continuing to ask the lord that he will continue to allow me to live that life of surrender so that I <clears throat> remain an evangelist. Thank well, you. Wow, praise God. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Charles. Yeah. Anyone else? Anything that you noticed? Um, um, you know, uh, what really... Um, Something that was on, that's been on my mind is that um, you know, um, yeah, uh, Philip the apostle and Philip the evangelist. So yeah, so Philip is um, you know, Phil, uh, yes, Avani. So we read about Philip here in um, um, in Acts chapter six. So it is the same person, Acts chapter six and um, uh, Acts chapter eight, um, and also Acts chapter twenty one. You know. It is the same person, the the Philip who served tables, the Philip who went to Samaria, uh, the Philip who met the uh, Ethiopian eunuch. Obviously, it's in the same, you know, narrative. And then much later, um, Acts chapter twenty-one, verse eight, uh, we read about Philip who met with Paul, and uh, Paul and the team stayed with him in Caesarea. So it, this is the same same Philip. No, right. Pastor, my question is the yeah. one who was the disciple of Jesus, Paul the you know, Philip the Apostles. He Jesus appointed twelve apostles. So one of them was Philip. So he is he the same? Um no, obviously not. So okay. yeah. So this is okay. uh, yeah. So uh, this is another um, yeah. So so this is Philip whom we see it was a young man who we see um, you know uh, uh coming to serve uh, and from Acts chapter. So that's the same. Person, yeah. Okay. Okay. Now I get it. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Any other uh, questions? Yes, Pastor. One more question I have. Yeah. Can I ask? Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So when we read in Acts chapter eight, verse seven, six and seven, that yeah. Philip, uh, when he was uh, preaching, uh, we see these unclean spirits crying with loud voice come out of many. Who were possessed. Mm. So now um, we've often observed, um, I mean, I have personally observed in churches when I went to different churches, in some, even while the worship is on, we see people manifesting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's not that uh, some kind of ministry is going on of casting out demons or, you know, but uh, we see uh, automatically, we see during the worship, these unclean mm. spirits, they manifest, they scream. And then, uh, you know, the pastor prays and they leave uh, okay. the person. 
but right. uh, it's very rare in the churches we don't see it often happening in the churches so uh, you know how do we understand why it happens in some churches and why we don't see this happening for ages you don't see anything happening in the churches mm. like that so why particularly mm. in some churches it's a regular feature like you see this happening but in few churches you never see mm. any i mean people haven't uh, you ask the people they haven't ever witnessed any such uh, mm. so yeah, how do you yeah. understand why does that happen in some church and why in not some in churches yeah so obviously uh, you know that particular region maybe the practices of the people uh, you know factors like that you know um, maybe they came under op oppression because of some dedications um, by the ancestors you know so many things why a person would come under you know be demonized um and that could be you know the reason um uh, that's not to say that the other place also you know it's not uh, you know uh, there's no manifestation but the fact one, one one reason is this the other reason that i can think of is that uh, well there it is a power encounter right it's an encounter uh, by the spirit, I mean, encounter um, that happens there, where the the Holy Spirit, the manifestation or anointing of the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, there's a power encounter in the sense the spirits are manifesting and leaving. Um, but it can also be a truth encounter in the sense a person, uh, a spirit, you know, an evil spirit. Uh, need not necessarily manifest in that way, but can leave a person and it can be an encounter of truth where a person is exposed to the truth of God's word, or maybe uh, where it is preached and, and, and a person makes a choice and the person makes a confession and comes out of bondage and, uh, you know, the spirit leaves, you know, people uh, testifying that, yes, um, uh, there is it seems to be you know, um, uh, some heaviness that has left or there's some clarity to the mind and thinking and and whatever was heavily oppressing all these weeks it has suddenly gone so it can be um you know something like that as well it can be a truth encounter it can be a power encounter um yeah so so the reason why in certain churches uh, it it obviously refers to you know the kind of people who are there and the kind of um, need that is there um so yeah so those are two things that i can think of yeah yeah so uh, one small follow-up question is it yeah. possible that a person who is oppressed by a demon can attend uh, a church for a long time and never manifest and uh, probably uh, you know carry on with it despite his yeah yeah so the thing is uh to what degree the person is, uh, you know, demonized in the sense, uh, uh, like what, to what degree do they have that person given place for the influence of the, um, you know, of the evil spirit in their lives? It could be a spirit of uncleanness. It could be a spirit of deception, you know, to what degree they have. Uh, so uh, obviously, you know, they, they might be coming and uh, in one area of their lives, probably they, they, they are believers. In one area of their lives, they have um, probably given you know, place for a foothold, right? Um, so they are, they are not possessed, they cannot be, but they are, you know, demonized to a certain degree in the sense in that particular area, you know, they have a given influence and control um, to the, the evil spirit. So yes, it is possible for a person to come like that. And maybe that, that area, uh, they have not given surrender to the Lord. And, uh, and every time they come to, you know, they come to church or, you know, they might be, you know, there is a drawing, there is a pulling, there is also a tension uh, where they are saying that, uh, you know, maybe, you know, this far and no more, you know, so, so this is obviously some kind of struggle. It could be, um, uh, yeah. Like I, I remember yes. uh, at one of the youth meetings, like, uh, like, yeah, I, I had come to know the Lord and then we, uh, we, we were, Part of the organizing of the youth meetings and um i remember my taking my cousin there and my cousin uh he after a meeting uh you know after the camp it was three days at the end of the meeting and people were making decisions and so on and then so we had a chat you know so i asked him oh, did you make any decision then he said uh, uh yeah i was actually trying i was planning to but then i had a i heard a voice saying you know you will never be able to keep up this decision or 
keep up this um, maintain this decision so so i did not and then we kind of spoke to him and encouraged him and uh, you know he was actually into a lot of uh you know dancing in temples you know that kind of thing he was interested in the classical indian classical dance and um he had actually gone very deep in that and and so he would so obviously he had this experience uh, you know after hearing the gospel and um so it took him some time to come out of of those things um yeah so so there is a struggle he wasn't manifesting or anything um but uh he didn't make the choice you know so it could be like that yeah yes pastor thank you yeah. so much yeah welcome Mali. anyone else um any questions or, or or something that that was really highlighted to you um Okay, um, you know what? What I was, um, what I was really thinking about is um, that maybe you know some of us in our in, in this class, you you are pastors already. You maybe you are you know leading a congregation, or uh, uh, maybe you are called to be pastors, right? You will be maybe in future uh, leading a church or leading a congregation. So, so the importance of sharing, um, uh, sharing. Uh, uh, or giving clarity about the call of God to the, you know, to the believer, I just felt that um, you know that was that was really important because uh, sometimes we uh, we don't do that and we we will want people. You know, let's say you know I have a certain call of God in my life and God wants to use me in a certain way, and then I think that every believer needs to do the same thing, you know, because this is what I'm doing. So I just say, okay, this is what you do. You you know you. Uh, God has called you to ministry. You better leave your job. Okay, uh, you better resign, and you better do this. And you know, I'm I, of course I, I'm modeling it for the person, but I'm also uh, not really teaching the whole thing, right? Uh, that there are uh, differences in ministries, and uh, when it comes to uh, evangelism and uh, being an evangelist, so to really, uh, you know, not control the person and not really uh, it's it's an important responsibility you know as a pastor to help them uh, help people discover the call um and uh, point them to the word and and to the dependence on the holy spirit and saying that hey, this is these are the options before you uh, and you are free right to choose and uh, to follow the spirit of god in carrying them out and even as an evangelist you know there could be you know you could be maybe having a profession, having a business. Uh, maybe God has called you to do something, and then you know, uh, and 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 be an evangelist in, in the in the corporate world, maybe, um, and have access to people, have access to lives which are, which a pastor may not, where a typical evangelist may not have access, right? So it could be you know several of those things. So to really the to teach um, the congregation uh, the importance of that. Right. For, maybe for those of us who are, you know, pastors and who are called to, uh, you know, in that, maybe you'll remember this, you know, when you are uh, mentoring people, leading people to, to, you know, stir up the gift, to point them to the call of God, help them discover the call of God in their lives, uh, but also, you know, show them the distinction and release them uh, uh, to the calling that God has for them. Okay. So, Sam. It is amazing to learn about Philip and how he pioneered evangelism to the point where all his oh yeah I know that's something um, obviously he modeled his life you know example well and also it so happened that all four were prophesying yeah so it could be different I guess uh, Rose um, what was the revelation from the Lord that made okay made me made you go into full time ministry was it supernatural or the Lord opened the way for you okay yeah so um, so for me, yeah, I think it was a growing desire. You know, it was a growing desire to uh, to really serve the Lord in the full time capacity. Um, so, uh, you know, I think I, I shared that I used to work. Um, I, I was in corporate sales, so for about um, eight years, and um, so every time weekends were 
you know, obviously weekends were spent in church. It was a busy um, time for us. We used to help out in worship, help out in uh, youth ministry. So uh, normally all our Saturdays and Sundays would be, you know, doing that. And there are, of course, the week, uh, during the week there was obviously you know office and home and other things so so that was how it was so it was a it was really a growing thing growing desire and also um there there came a point when there were some specific you know instructions uh, there were some specific prophetic words there were some specific um, uh, quickening of scripture from the word of god um, so uh, so it was like that there were some you know specific guideposts and uh, god used that to confirm what was already in my heart and uh, to take and and opened up it opened up the right door of opportunity uh, for me to step in and uh, and even then it was not uh, what I am doing at present, right? it was it was more of an administrative uh, administrative function, administrative task, um, with maybe eighty percent of that, and maybe twenty percent of that. Uh, uh, the other twenty percent was probably spiritual ministry. You know, like leading worship and maybe sharing the word when, when there was no one. You know, like pastor was traveling or something like. That. So it was like that when I after I came in, and um, so. Um, so uh, so if you want to ask some specifics what was the revelation uh, i would i would just say the specific thing was a growing desire so you know if maybe if uh, many of you shared right like you didn't know you can't really tell the date time you know when you actually accepted the lord and uh, for me also it was the same thing and also this was a growing desire to do something to serve the lord and we we just did that right so it wasn't like a very well defined moment about just went about serving the lord and i could see that more and more god wanted me to step into that right um but a couple of times powerful moments were when i came to, i think i shared this in the holy spirit class last year so uh, uh, very well uh, I mean, defining moments were when i came to apc all people's church for the first time and it was to lead worship uh, for an evening meeting. So I came there, uh, led worship, went out to um, to uh, to answer some calls from a client. And there were some missed calls from the client. So I went out to uh, call, make those calls. And that's when uh, my wife came and called me and said, hey, the preacher wants to talk to us, talk to you. So the meeting was still happening. So I went there. It was a guest. It was a, it was a visiting. Uh, it was a guest speaker, not Pastor Ashish. And the first thing that he said, he tells me as I went up, uh, you know, I was feeling a little embarrassed. People were, you know, I just led worship and I wasn't in church. I wasn't in the meeting. I had gone out, you know, I was feeling a little embarrassed. Everybody's looking. And so I, it was a small crowd. Um, so, but uh, I just went up front. And the first thing the person said was, uh, God is calling you to be a pastor. And this is what I see and so on. And, um, uh, at the end of the meeting, of course, he asked me, you know, did it witness to your heart? And, and there was no witness. I, I didn't know that term, witnessing to your heart also. And uh, I said, no, I mean, the first thing, first time somebody had said this to me um, and uh, and so on. But I noticed that I just made a note of it and I wrote it down. But I but I noticed that every time, this was about sep in September, right? Uh, in September 2001. So every uh, time every september october there would be a quickening there would be a prophetic word so because i i mean i i fall i saw that pattern i would write it down and much later realize hey this is september october there's something you know which was pointing to in the direction and i was quite happy you know working uh, doing my thing serving god on the weekends but there was this constant push nudge and till i found myself uh, walking suddenly one day in it and uh, yeah so that was how it was i know it can be different for different people but for me that is how it was okay yeah right that's right um the desire to serve the desire to yeah yeah so as long as we are not you know having a pre um, you know, predetermined scenario. I mean, even that could be God's desire, you know, like a big, a big vision, right? 
uh, or maybe preaching to thousands, you know, that kind of thing. It could be. But as long as, you know, we don't set that scenario, right? Uh, but if it's, if it's God-given, you know, just go ahead and say, God, you have called me to this. So this is what I have in mind. Um, like if you see Philip, he, he didn't care. Right, if it, if it, if it was uh, if it's go it was going to be an audience of one to whom he was sharing, or if it was going to be an audience of, you know, ten. Um, so as long as we serve, and as long as we are faithful, uh, we will definitely find ourselves walking in the fullness of God's God. So, so I, I think we should not really uh, be worried about you know that, especially you know when you're uh, like if you're uh, in a Bible college be trained for ministry, you know, that can be a worry. Okay, what next? You know, people are going to ask, them, my neighbor's going to ask, you went to Bible college, now what are you doing? What next? No, don't worry about that. You know, you could maybe after you soon after you finish, you could maybe go in for higher studies. Maybe some of you, maybe some of you are just called to start a new work and and that's fine. So maybe some of you, you know, you just go back to what you're doing. Right, and all what you're doing right now, and uh, and then you will walk into the fullness of it. You know, you just begin to serve, um, serve from what you've learned. Serve, uh, you know, maybe even I'm sure this these two years or three years, um, the way you serve is going to be different. The way you relate to God is going to be different. With, you know, your, uh, you know, the scope widened and uh, and so on. So just continue to be faithful in that. Right, that is what I would say. And and then don't uh, just you know. Don't worry uh, and then say, God, you know, um, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Or, you know, uh, let that not be a, uh, a worry or anxiety. Um, just continue to serve. Yeah. Okay. So let's um, let's let's move forward. Okay. If you have other questions, you can ask later as well. Okay. So let's let's move forward. So we see this about Philip and. Uh, you know, he, Philip actually preached in uh, different locations, uh, different people, uh, different crowds, and, uh, and and this is what he did, right? So we also read about um, um, people who, uh, along with Philip, who, who were actually um, running for their lives, who were persecuted, who went about preaching the gospel. And, uh, and one such group is what, uh, you know, planted the church in Antioch. Right. Uh, we, we read about that. Um, let me just go back to Acts, and uh, so yeah, Acts chapter uh, yeah, Acts chapter eleven. Okay, uh, Acts chapter eleven, verse nineteen. Now those who were scattered. After the persecution that arose over Stephen, so he's referring to Acts chapter seven, right? Um, now those who were sc scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as you know these other places, Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but Jews only. Okay, but some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, and uh, uh, and the hand of the Lord was with them, verse 20, 21, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. So we see that. Uh, um, so in Antioch, obviously, you know, when people responded, the work started, the church. So we don't even know the names of the people, right, who traveled, who shared. Philip, of course, is recorded, but uh, who, who did this work and a great church, Antioch, uh, a mission missionary church, uh, that we read. Uh, Acts chapter 13 talks about Antioch, church in Antioch. There were prophets, there were teachers, uh, people like Barnabas, Simeon, um, and others, and Saul, who became Paul, he was also there. And they, Paul does, you know, uh, his missionary journey actually starts from there. They are ministering to the Holy Spirit. God gives them directions and starts from there, right? So you see that there were people whom we do not know names, uh, do not know their names, so, but um, in the New Testament, in uh, in the epistles, in the book of Acts, we see that they went about doing this, right? They didn't care. They obviously didn't care about titles or whatever, but they just did the work of ministry, right? So, so we understand that. We learn uh, from that. Okay. Uh, another place where we can uh, see, uh, learn about what was really happening at that time is the um, uh, third epistle of John. Like this. So that's three John. 
and uh, this is an instruction that John gives um, to the church, uh, to the elder of the church, uh, Gaius. So three John and verse, um, okay, uh, which is yeah, verse five. Okay, verse five, three John and verse five. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church, if you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well, because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. Okay, so he's talking about um, uh, whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers, okay. So it's talking about um, uh, brethren, people whom they knew, who were believers, and so on. And it also talks about strangers uh, who were uh, obviously traveling, visiting, and he um, says, you know, they have borne witness of your love before the church, you know, before the body of believers. Um, so send them forward is the instruction. He's saying just help them, uh, send them forward. Uh, meaning uh, take care of their expenses as they go from this place um, to the other place, uh, maybe travel, whatever they might need for, uh, you know, accommodation and everything. So involving money. So send them forward uh, in a manner worthy of God, right? So he's saying send them forward in in a manner that's worthy of God. They, they're, doing, uh, they're doing good work. So uh, help them and you will do well if you do that. Uh, and then he says, uh, because they uh, staying, you know, they went for the sake, went, went, they're traveling, they're doing this for the sake of the Lord, and they're not taking anything from the Gentiles, you know, the non-Jewish people. So they're not taking anything from them, but uh, uh, because they will just want to share and uh, minister, and so we can help them. He's saying that uh, we ought to receive such, okay, be hospitable uh, for such kind of traveling ministers itinerant ministers receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth so that we are part of this team that we might partner in this great work for the sake of the truth that we might partner for the cause of the kingdom right so uh, so that's the instruction which uh, john gives and uh, and then we see that uh, you know that is something that so, so we understand that yes, uh, there were people traveling. There were, uh, and from many of uh, Paul, Apostle, I mean, Paul's epistles, when we read First Corinthians, when we read Second Corinthians, and uh, especially Second Corinthians, he writes about the false apostles, or uh, he writes about ministers who were actually um, taking care of their own things or their own needs, and who were uh, abusing the hospitality. They were manipulating people. So we know that, well, even from that negative example, we see that uh, this was happening, right? So people were preaching for the wrong, with wrong motives, right? Uh, so uh, we, we see that as well. We, and, and we see uh, where Paul writes and he says, you know, uh, uh, people were speaking with um, or ministering with uh, preaching the gospel with the wrong motivations and and uh, another place where he says is i think in philippians where uh, yeah philippians also he talks about that um the former verse 16 philippians 1 and verse 16 where he says the former preached christ from selfish ambition not sincerely okay uh, so this is also so even from the negative this thing we see that well there were people uh, who were traveling, who were uh, preaching, who were sharing the gospel, right? So we understand that about the early church. There were itinerant traveling ministers, right? Okay, so we then we, uh, about Paul himself, uh, Paul testifies. He's, he's talking about his own ministry. And of course, when we read the book of Acts, uh, when we read about the first missionary journey the second missionary journey and 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 this third missionary journey we, we see the kind of uh, the kind of work that he did and he's referring to uh, himself as the apostle you know he writes and he says paul an apostle right uh, apostolos the sent out one um the commissioned one okay and he also 
again reminds himself you know several epistles is not from men or through man but through jesus christ um so he referred to him as the apostle but if you look at the ministry he did preach the gospel in different locations to different people right uh, let's look at romans 15 and verse 17 okay romans 15 and verse 17 where um it says uh, therefore i have reason to glory in christ jesus in the things which pertain to god for i will not dare to speak of any of those things which christ has not accomplished through me in work and deed to make the gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the spirit of god so that from jerusalem and round about to illyricum i have fully preached the gospel of christ and so i have made it my aim to preach the gospel not where christ was named lest i should build on another man's foundation okay so so the thing is that um um uh, uh, sorry i'll let me read the other verse also but as it is written to whom he was not announced they shall see and those who have not heard shall understand and uh, so that was paul's uh, ministry so and also his um uh, you know something that he held as value that he wanted to preach where the gospel had not been preached which was which was the non jewish world you know where uh, even in the jewish world like where he would go to the synagogues and preach and so on so but he made it his aim to preach where the gospel was not preached and he didn't he uh, uh that, that that does not mean that he uh, looked down on you know uh places where it was already be snow he of course he went to ephesus and they they were already believers there you know when we read uh, uh the book of acts we see that in ephesus acts chapter 9 i think right we read about uh, um uh yeah uh, his um, him going to ephesus probably it's uh, something else not acts 9 uh just one minute sorry um yeah not acts 9 sorry it's i think it's acts um um yeah acts 19 sorry not acts 9 acts 19 so um so so he comes to Ephesus, so so he did preach there but his main thing uh it was to to do a pioneering work so he was apostolic in that way right um to do pioneering work um to open up new territories to take the gospel where it was not heard but he fully preached the gospel of christ he was a bearer of glad tidings right? he preached the gospel the message uh, um, and as a person the bearer and uh, the one who preached he he did the work of preaching the gospel the work of an evangelist right so um so we see this in the early church and i'm sure that when we read through we will we will see different uh, um we will see other things as well like other people who um who were doing the work of um the gospel uh, work of the evangelist and who are ministering but maybe we can you know notice some of these people who were specifically doing the work of the evangelist also right so that is what we see in the early church now for us to again understand so this is the work of ministry so not everybody who becomes a believer and calls um or or has a calling for ministry need not be referred to an evangelist referred to as an evangelist right or called the pastor and uh, we see that this was a specific a call of god and uh, and this is how the person worked and some of the things that we notice is that a passion to share the gospel like even if i my life is in danger you know the a passion to share the gospel that christ must be made known okay so we see that and uh, we see that uh, the, uh, the that passion also drove the person drove the evangelist uh, to several other places where christ name was was not preached or was not heard or where the where the person was um, led by the spirit of god right that is also another very important thing where the where the ministry gift you know generally if you look at the ministry gift it's partnering with god okay so which means that god is the one is sending god is the one who's the uh, who's designing everything and um, and he is the one who is actually 
uh, sending us out, right? Like what we see Paul writing to the Corinthian church, saying that, um, verse 9, Acts, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9. Okay. Um, can somebody read that, please? It's a very uh, important verse. Acts, I'm sorry, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9. Um, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. Thank you, Sam. So, so this is what uh, you know. He's uh, telling the Corinthian church, which has so much of confusion because of comparison and so on, saying, "You are God's fellow workers." Or, or we are God's fellow workers. Okay, we are God's fellow workers. So, what does that mean? Fellow workers, co-workers, co-laborers. So. In other words, saying we are partners with God in this mission. But he is the one who, is, who has the heart, who has commissioned us, but we are partners with him. <coughs> Sorry. We are partners with him. We are partnering with him. And we are, in other words, in modern day, modern terms, we can say that he's saying that we are God's leagues. That absolutely changes, right? So with the passion, with the desire to serve, to preach, because of the way circumstances are, as in the case of you know how it was for Philip, what are the circumstances? Not the ideal of circumstance. Circumstances, most difficult, uh, life was in danger, but the stirring and the passion and the reality of changed destinies, uh, which he was already, you know, well acquainted with, which already knew, saw that, was, you know, was just propelling him to share, right? And even with ministerial success and fruitfulness, to be sensitive to such a degree to the leading of God that he would even obey to uh, to reach out to one person, right? So so we we see that happening. So so um, and we see uh, in the role of evangelist that uh, well, healing, deliverance, right? It is part and parcel of the ministry of God. Um, no need to shy away from it, but really to pursue it. You know, maybe uh, we didn't see it, we prayed. Well, just pursue hunger, go after, um, because we studied 1 Corinthians 14, Paul writes and he says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. Desire spiritual gifts, right? And all the gifts of the Spirit, are obviously, um, we see healing and miracles and deliverance uh, being a big part of the ministry of the evangelist, but we, we pursue all. We desire all, pursue love, desire all, the gifts of the Spirit. Why do you desire the gifts of the Spirit? Obviously, the instruction is there because God desires, His desire is for us to desire so that we, uh, God desire being the manifestation of the Spirit in our ministry. Right, so that's God's desire that He wants to see the manifestation of the Spirit in our serving, in our ministering. Right, so for us to hunger for that and and not to shy away from that, and to look for opportunities for that, and to believe God and be expectant of that, you know, um, and and we, we can look for opportunities. We can look for you know. Uh, Especially, you know, there are needs everywhere, and people uh, obviously uh, maybe sharing, saying, "I have this problem, I have this thing," and and yeah, we we can ask God to intervene in those circumstances. And I remember, you know, um, like uh, people who are needy, you know, people begging on streets. Um, you know, I, I sometimes, you know, have the time to talk. Just tell them, 
that i used to tell them like uh, okay i'll give you this but but i want to pray for you okay and i want to pray for you in the name of the lord jesus and um, and this is what jesus did okay uh of course if they understand the language you know take the time to share and they say uh, this is what jesus did on the cross i'm praying that's why i'm praying in the name of jesus and i'm going to pray right uh, uh, so taking that uh, you know taking those opportunities to see uh, to do that and expecting god to manifest uh, in those moments right right so um so we see this happening in the ministry of the evangelist so it's much bigger than um than just uh taking a message it's uh, it's much bigger than that you realize that you are actually partnering with god you realize that it's it's a team right you are in god's team and he's the one who's releasing the gifts he's the one who's putting you into that you realize that okay um uh, all other role models you know sometimes what, here's the thing you know sometimes we we go by maybe flawed models of ministry right flawed models of ministry and maybe it worked for a season maybe uh, you know there there are there are people who are exploiting those kinds of methods for their own um, ends and and so wrong models really being wrong wrong role models really being set uh, in ministry right so but the thing is to uh, to go be led by the spirit of god not to be swayed by any of that uh, uh, and to to stay true to the call stay true to the call to serve and that's the most important thing okay okay so let's look at um the next topic which is uh, the historical or uh, the restoration historical aspect of the evangelist uh, but which is actually the restoration of the ministry of the evangelist so probably we'll we'll talk about that for some time and then we'll uh, we'll continue in our next session right so so we see that um, yeah in uh, your previous class was church history right so so you 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 would have learned that um, you know this church this book of acts uh, the church in the book of acts we see so vibrant for you know for four uh, four centuries and and or, or you know for that time for hundreds of years and then we see that something come in a sense of uh, uh, a lukewarmness uh, and a sense of uh, uh, you know a formal religion setting in uh after uh, uh around 400 AD right we see we see that happening and what followed that was uh, almost a millennia of uh, of a, a dark season of what is called the dark ages by the theologians and and uh, historians uh, uh, following the church you know, where the this kind of vibrancy was not there in the church although they were you know there were individuals there were groups of people um but predominantly we see that church had become uh, uh, more about rituals more about outside form and uh, it was it had become a you know like what the lord jesus warned right uh, become a form denying the power denying denying the transformative power so the word itself had come to be uh, chained you know literally right the word was only uh, the cross the bible was only in a, in a, in a language like latin and uh, others the common man could not understand common man was not allowed to understand uh, no translation was allowed it, it had come to such a place you know such um, and um, it's it's sad that you see that right um, the state of the church uh, it's very difficult to understand okay is is this the church right? but we also see from 1400 AD you know different def- definitive moves of god where the where god is restoring or god, god starts to bring back uh, to the church what was lost uh, in, in terms of theology in terms of structure and, uh, and a lot of the theology a lot of the doctrine and the ministry uh, offices and so on so we see that being restored right so um so we we're going to talk about uh, the ministry uh, uh, aspect the restoration of the ministry of the evangelist now it uh, with regard to the time period it, it cuts across it goes uh, you know even uh, touches during those times uh, before the reformation and uh, and and in and, and talks about you know different people who were involved and so on so it's very interesting 
and we're not going in, into the details of each of these uh, movements um, or each of these uh, personalities. Just going to name a few, but I, I really like to, you know, encourage us to to read some of these names, some of these people, and what they did. It was not like they were the perfect people or they taught the perfect thing, but um, you know, they had a passion for God, right? It was, it was not like they they were, um, I mean, they did not have limitations and, and it's not like they, uh, you know, there was nothing, everything was perfect about them, right? They had their limitations, they had their failings, uh, uh, but God used them and, uh, and we see that, right? Um, so let's look at a few of them. Okay, so some of the historians like Eusebius, um, one of the earliest of the church uh, historians. So he talks about how after the apostles, and um, this is of course uh, information that's uh, outside of uh, you know from of the uh, scriptures, which where you know which we also see in scripture that there were people who were traveling and who were sharing, preaching the word. The, the the fellowships or the body of believers helping them to do this right helping them so that they could go from place to place so that they could carry the gospel and uh, and they could share okay so we we see that happening some of the names mentioned there are you know uh, Pantaneus of Alexandria who is who uh, supposedly traveled uh, uh, as uh, close to India you know and um, and then we read about several of the movements uh, or the groups which which were which actually gathered around you know just like I'm sure you would have studied about the denominations right because of the restorative move of God there was a person or people who taught that particular truth and there were you know people or denominations which were formed because of that truth which was proclaimed. Right, and um, and and we see the same thing. There, there were some movements, and they were, of course, recognized by the name of the leaders or or some other name. But we see that uh, you know several names like um, the Bogomils. Um, we read about uh, the Hussites, and Hussites actually, um, you know, about uh, yeah, uh, his name is his name is spelt J A N, but he's called Jan Jan Hus. Um, and uh, and how uh, he, uh, um, he they were, they were a, a group of people who who were actually uh, reforming you know the, the church or Anus was much before Luther Martin Luther uh, but saw the kind of um, excesses they were there the controls that were there the, the things that were not in accordance with godliness not in accordance with the church and then you know uh, bringing about a kind of uh, reformation to that, trying to bring in change to that. Um, so you read about the Hussites, you read about the the Lollards. Okay, so the Lollards again um, were um, who gathered around the message of John Wycliffe, right? Wycliffe, and who was who did a lot of Bible translation, and that term itself, uh, Lollard, means to mutter from the from the medieval Dutch. Uh, Trans, uh, it's a Dutch word, right? Uh, which means to mutter, and probably it uh, it was referring to their style of worship. You know, they they would read scriptures they, while meditating, just like the old the Hebrew uh, way of you know uh, muttering, meditating on the word. So, so probably it referred to that. So they were called lolads, um, a small group, again you know, wanting to reform the church. So they would travel, they would uh, uh, minister, they would share the gospels, which took them away from their own homelands to other shows, right? So they would go travel, uh, share. Then there were other movements like uh, the Puritans, the Methodists, Presbyterian Baptists, um, which sent out missionaries which sent out people um, saying that hey, this is a message which is worth sharing this needs to go to other lands as well right so we read about uh, uh, you know people like john wesley people like um, uh, the wesleyan brothers charles and john wesley and um, interesting how they uh, in the in england from the church of england and who were kind of uh, charles john actually he found it too cold, too, uh, you know, 
ritualistic and and both of them had a change of heart in uh, in what is called the alders gate uh, meeting alders gate society alders gate meeting the message that was preached touched them it was uh, uh, someone the, the speaker there was reading about uh, a preface to um what martin uh, preface to uh, preface which was a preface to that message which was martin luther's uh, uh something to do with martin luther's is writing and uh, all his testimony and then you know the message was about romans the book of romans salvation by faith uh, salvation by grace through the faith so um so that was that really touched their hearts and um, so we read about these people who travel who move from place to place who uh, and especially the uh, wesley brothers you, you see that they moved from from the england to america and uh, both continents you know they they shared they ministered right and and others like john um, george Whit whitefield and others are there okay, so we'll stop here uh we'll look at uh, the other people also but you know if you're going through the notes um you see these names you can you can you can just read about it maybe check on the internet and it's interesting right uh, to see the kind of work uh, they did the kind of evangelism they did okay and from that also we see oh, not only do we see the restoration of the ministry of evangelists but we also see the methods some of the methods they used okay okay so we'll stop here and uh, we'll meet again in our next class Thank you so much. God bless. Have a great day. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, Pastor. See you guys.